Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum and I'm here today at the Rock Island Auction Company taking a look at another one of the U.S. military breech-loading carbines of the Civil War. Now, during the Civil War, the U.S. military would prove very reluctant to adopt any sort of new technology for the infantry, focusing instead on maintaining the use of muzzle-loading rifles for the infantry. They were a known they were they're a known factor for their efficacy, for their reliability, and more importantly, for their production. The military knew that they could reliably produce large numbers of these guns, and that was more important than trying to get some newfangled cartridge technology or something. However, different standards applied to the cavalry. Cavalry were, uh, well, had a really hard time loading a muzzle-loading rifle from horseback, as you might expect. Uh, cavalry were also being used in much smaller unit numbers, and it was much safer in a sort of logistical sense to kind of experiment with cavalry arms. And so the Union military and the Confederate military to a lesser extent would experiment extensively with a huge number of different carbines during the Civil War, breech loading carbines in fact. Uh, of these, the fourth most popular was this one, the Smith carbine. This was uh, patented, designed by a guy named uh, Gilbert Smith out of New York. He was a physician, and he actually designed this relatively, you know, a couple years before the Civil War. He was getting, he got patents on it in 1855, 56, and 57, and he had a head start on a lot of his competitors because, by the way, a whole lot of people decided to try and come up with new carbines to sell the government during the Civil War. But Gilbert Smith had a head start on them because he actually got his first order for these from the military in February of 1860, over a year before the Civil War started. Now, it was only an order for 300 guns, but still, 300 guns, $35 a piece, that's not chump change. Of course, Gilbert Smith, physician from New York, does not have a rifle factory, nor does he have a rifle sales program, so he partnered up with a company called Pulteney & Trimble out of Baltimore to actually sell the guns for him. That was kind of how you did things before the internet existed. And Pulteney and Trimble then contracted, subcontracted the manufacturing of the guns to machine companies that they had worked with. So these were actually made over the course of their production by three different companies. Uh, the Massachusetts Arm Company, the American Arms Company, I believe it was called, and American Machine Works. Uh, American Machine Works and Massachusetts Arms Company being by far the, the majority of the production. So when the Civil War kicks off, the Union military decides, well, we're going to need some more guns here. And so they already have this working relationship with Pulteney and Trimble for this known factor of a carbine. And so they call up Pulteney and they basically say, you know, we want to buy like a couple tens of thousands of these guns. Pulteney and Trimble is very happy to sell them as many as they would like at $35 a piece. And the government comes back with, you know, what, okay, we're willing to pay a high price for 300 guns because it's a small number, but if we're going to order like 10,000 of them, well, we need a discount. And they ultimately negotiate a contract for 10,000 guns at $32.50 a piece. However, Pulteney and Trimble's manufacturing subcontractors aren't able to make good on this, and ultimately that contract only about 1,500 would be delivered. However, Pulteney and Trimble were competent business people, and they solved this problem and got more guns into production, and there would actually be a pretty much continuous sequence of contracts for Smith carbines through the course of the Civil War, with a grand total of about 31,000 being delivered to the military in total. So this has a somewhat unique system and uses a very interesting cartridge. Let me go ahead and show you all that. Now the very first Smith carbines did not actually have this sling bar. The very first ones had sling swivels on the handguard and the stock. However, Early field reports came back that it was really pretty difficult to carry this thing across one's back, and so the government decided that it would rather have a single point sling bar on the side of the guns, uh, and the manufacturing was changed as uh, well, changed to put the bar on. So uh, early guns will have sling swivels, those are generally Massachusetts Arms Company guns. Later ones have this sling bar. Apparently, there are a few little transitional ones that have both, but that's a pretty rare thing to find. Now, pretty much all of our markings are here on the left side of the receiver. Uh, we have the sales company, which is Pulteney & Trimble of Baltimore. We have the patent information, which is kind of hidden under that sling bar. Smith's patent of 1857. And then we have the manufacturer's marking, which is really hard for me to film because it's sitting underneath that sling bar. Uh, this one is an American Machine Works, which is heavily abbreviated. Let's see if we can get it from the top. Manufactured by... Yes, 
A-M-N, American, M-C-H-N, machine. Can we get the last word? No, it says works over there, W-K. And that company was located in Springfield, Massachusetts. The serial number is on the bottom of the frame. There's one serial number on the barrel side and a second serial number split across the receiver side. All three manufacturers had their own serial number ranges, each starting at one, so there are plenty of duplicate serial numbers. If you're going to describe one of these guns by number, you also have to include the manufacturer name. And we have a couple little inspector marks on the gun in the form of initials. The LFR is Lafayette F. Rogers. And we have a JH cartouche in the stock from Joseph Hannes. These are just the guys who are tasked with inspecting their guns for the military and confirming that they were in fact good. We've got a fairly decent little uh, V-notch rear sight there and a nice big visible blade sight in the front. Now the action of course is the cool part, so I'm going to go ahead and put this at half cock. This used a cartridge, a self-contained cartridge, without a priming mechanism. That cartridge was manufactured out of India rubber, so it was kind of like a rubber boot with a little hole in the back for priming. Uh, for the flash hole, which you'll see in a moment, and then a bullet at the front and powder in the middle. There were apparently some, some times during the Civil War when that rubber became very difficult to get, and they did experiment with a paper or foil wrap instead of rubber, which worked, but not as well. Um, the rubber was there to serve as the obturator. So you've got a pair of cones, a male cone and a female cone there, to kind of join these two receiver halves, which, by the way, are ultimately held together by this spring bar, which I can push up with this front trigger, push that up and then you can break it open. Uh, the two cones plus the rubber material of the cartridge actually did a pretty good job uh, sealing the breech on this. They're, that was part of the reason these guns were relatively well liked, is they actually worked. You will also notice that the breech opens not at the exact back nor at the front, but really halfway down the length of the cartridge. So. You would break the gun open like this at 90 degrees, put your cartridge into the front half, and then you can close the rear half over it, cock the hammer the rest of the way, and then you're ready to fire. Ballistically, this is not the world's most robust cartridge ever. It is a 50 caliber bore, used a 350 grain bullet over a charge of 40 grains of black powder. So not, not super hard shooting. But that's kind of a good thing out of what is only a seven and a half pound carbine. I will also point out the length of pull on this looks relatively long, but it actually handles, at least for me, very nicely. Overall, the Smith carbines were actually pretty well liked by the troopers who had to use them. Not universally, but none of this stuff is universally liked by you know, a variety of different people in different circumstances. But the Smith saw combat in a variety of different battles during the Civil War. Uh, when, it was, when commanders were polled, unit commanders, it was something like two-thirds, three-quarters of them thought that the Smith carbine was a good or a very good firearm. So as Civil War carbines go, that's a, a pretty ringing endorsement. Of course, once the war ended, there would be no further need for carbines like this. Uh, there wasn't really any, any demand on the civilian market because you know, shortly after the Civil War ended, there were a tremendous number of guns like this available super cheap on the surplus market because the U.S. government dumped a lot of this stuff that they didn't need, especially non-standard guns like Smiths and other carbines. They would keep Spencers, they would keep Sharps, I believe, but uh, a lot of the rest of the stuff just surplus it out. We don't need it. We don't want to pay to warehouse it. So uh, there were about 35,000 of these guns made in total, about 31,000 of them delivered to the military. So there are some commercial private sale ones out there, but the vast majority of them are uh, military ones like this. Uh, a lot of them towards the end of the war ended up being delivered to the military, but then remaining in, uh, in storage and not actually being issued, which leads to some guns like this one that are in remarkably good condition for being as old as they are. Now, if you'd like to see more about this particular one, you can check it out in the Rock Island, the most recent Rock Island auction catalog. Uh, you can also check out their Instagram page and their YouTube channel. I have links to both of those down in the description text below. Thanks for watching.